day, two schoolgirls and four women were shot in a drive-by uh, shooting in London. A girl of seven uh, is fighting for her life. And, of course, this comes off the back of shootings in Liverpool. Ellie Edwards, 25-year-old killed, nine-year-old Olivia Pratt-Cabell. Does Britain have a problem with gun crime? Well, look, I can't comment, on, obviously, on this terrible uh, case yesterday. Uh, there's obviously a live investigation underway. But, look, it's one of the reasons why we've recruited 15,000 more police officers since 2019, since the election, when we made that commitment. And also, we've seen an effect from that. In London, for example, which is where this latest case was, we've seen the police seizing um, a significant number of weapons and we've seen a reduction in violent crime of 7%. But, obviously, each individual tragedy is terrible and my thoughts go out to those families concerned. And I know the police will be looking at this case uh, and making progress as fast as they can. Is it too easy for people to get guns? Well, look, we have incredibly tough laws in this country. Um, about people not being able to get guns. And obviously it depends people on them. them right? But then it obviously depends on, on incredibly good policing, which, as I say, is why we've recruited more police officers. To make up um, for the shortfall for the, the numbers we've, that were coming. We've be recruited more police officers, and that's why we've seen a reduction in, in violent crime. And I hope that, that a positive trend continues. OK. Now, teachers have backed plans for a strike next month. Uh, they say it's likely to follow the pattern of the rail union, and you, of course, know more than uh, anyone at how disruptive uh, those rail strikes have been. What impact could strikes in schools have? Well, look, first of all, we don't, we don't know that. We've seen some briefing in some newspapers. The only ballot result that we have seen for, t for a teachers' union actually was that it didn't reach the threshold um, and therefore they're not able to... I think that was the NASUWT, not able to actually go out on strike. But clearly, uh, any strikes, anything disrupting children's education would be very regrettable. Uh, children obviously had their education disrupted uh, during the COVID pandemic. The last thing we want to see is children's education disrupted. Now, that's why the Education Secretary, for example, met um, and her team met teachers' unions to talk about the government's evidence, the independent pay review bodies, and to listen to the concerns that teachers have got. And that's what the government wants to do. It's back to the independent pay review bodies and it wants to listen to the concerns that the teachers have about, uh, you know, about education. Um, I want to talk about the pay review body uh, in a moment, but, you know, the National Education uh, Union uh, says that pay's fallen by 23% relative to inflation since 2010. It's a complaint that's echoed uh, in our health service uh, as well. We read today uh, that the nursing union has said that twice as many nurses are going to be walking out in February. I mean, what impact... Could that have on patient care? Will safe numbers be maintained? Well, well look, on, on the health service, um, again, we, we've put an extra... a significant amount of money into the health service in the autumn statement, an extra £14 billion. And, in fact, not just into health, but also, importantly, into social care, because that's one of the things that's causing some of the delays in, in A&E. Uh, on pay, we've supported the independent pay review body. So, on the health service, this is really important. There, there were recommendations that... Uh, for example, would see the starting salary of a nurse increase by £1,400. And we accepted those recommendations in full. Um, and, of course, what happened this week again were ministers met the health unions to listen to their concerns about pay and other working conditions okay. and also to, to talk about the government's evidence to the pay review bodies for the, the forthcoming year. Well, I just want to deep dive a little bit into the pay review mm -hmm. body, uh, if I may, because, look, this is what we always <clears> get <throat> from the government, that it's all down to the independent pay review body, that you're accepting the recommendations. I just feel like it's a bit more complicated than that, actually. Um, so, in your letter to them last year, you said it's vital that planned workforce growth is affordable and within the budget set, particularly as there is a direct relationship between pay and staff numbers. And it's the same with this year's uh, letter. So, in this year's letter, you say it has to be within the yeah. budget set. And then you go on to say, in the current economic context, it's particularly important that you also have regard to the government's inflation target, which is 2%, mm -hmm. when forming recommendations. So you're effectively saying, look, guys, this is what we budgeted for pay. If you go over it, people are going to get snacked and you're going to contribute to inflation. Doesn't sound that independent. Well, no, we, we've set out the context, which is we've set out what the health service budgets are. And, and as I said, we've put an extra £14 billion into that. And there are, there are significantly more nurses and more doctors. But you don't have to be in that order, does it? You could get 
get their recommendations first before well, you set the budget. I think it's That's important, actually well, what the pay review body say would be a good it, idea. I think it's important to set out the, the context. They should know what the overall economic context is. That's part of the government's evidence. The other thing they look at, they're specifically tasked to look at recruitment and retention. So that's one of the things, for example, the unions have said they're concerned about. That's another important thing the pay review bodies look at. So they look at workforce, workforce planning. And then, of course, they also get evidence in from the trade unions, which will be looking at it from their perspective. So the pay review body has evidence across the board. They have the government's views, the union's views, and then they come to an independent view and last year, that's what the government accepted. And by the way, they've also complained that you give your evidence so late that they can't actually really influence it because your evidence is so late that the budgets have been set. I just want to have a look at their own uh, response because the <coughs> independent pay review uh, themselves uh, say uh, in settling the Department of Health and Social Care and the NHS budget, which totals £173.8 billion, the government assumed a headline pay award of 2% for NHS staff. The department has an additional 1% contingency, which it's choosing to make available, providing an overall affordable headline pay award of up to 3%. So you pretty much set the parameters, don't you? You make an assumption of what they're going to do, and you say, look, you've got a 1% contingency here. Well, if you don't, then people will get well, sacked. Well, you, you have to make a... When you're setting the budget for the NHS, you obviously have to make some assumptions. And you could a, ask we, them before you set the budget. This is my point. Well, and we, well, and then you we, could say, this is what they say should happen on pay. Let's form the budget around well, it. Well, if we did that, then what you would do is you'd get lots of health trusts coming to us saying we'd set the budgets very late in the day. So, look, we'd set the budgets for the health service. Um, we've made some assumptions, but we'll look at what the independent pay review body says. And I think people should judge us by what we've done in the past. Last year, we accepted in full the recommendations of that independent pay review body. That's what we delivered. Um, and, so, uh, and that's what led to pay rises in the NHS in line with uh, the rest of the economy, but which were focused actually at the lower paid um, uh, members of staff, which meant they actually had larger pay rises, which I think is the right thing to do. Um, just before we move on to rail strikes, um, with more nurses going on strike, um, with doctors potentially striking too, you know, you're obviously like a, a, a politician, but you're also human. Are you worried about the current situation in the NHS and could strikes have an impact on patient safety? Well, look, clearly um, when health staff go on uh, strike, you know, that is obviously going to have an impact on the health service. Um, we have to put detailed contingency plans in place, uh, working with uh, the, the NHS and health service managers to make sure we can still deliver safe care even on days when there are strikes. But there is clearly an impact when significant numbers of staff don't come to work. What is that impact then? Well, the impact can be seen from the fact that, you know, take ambulance services, for example, people have to wait longer for an ambulance to turn up, and that's, of course, regrettable, which is why health ministers are sitting down, listening to the trade unions, will accept the pay review body... Uh, we accepted the pay review body recommendations last year, and we look forward to ones this year. We're very committed to delivering on those, and that's why okay. we put a huge amount of extra resources into the health service. OK, um, let's talk rail strikes, uh, <clears throat> shall we? There has been some talk of potential progress uh, this uh, week. This is how it's been reported. Train operating companies are set to make a new offer to striking rail workers this week after receiving a revised mandate from the government. What? This is going to sound a bit silly, but what does that actually mean, a revised mandate from the government? What's happened? Well, it, it means the train operating companies have, have got permission from me to make a new offer to uh, rail unions. Uh, that's what they're going to be doing. Um, that's what I was asked to do. That's my role in the process. But it's important now that we give some space for the employers, so that's the train operating companies and Network Rail, to continue having discussions um, with the RMT um, uh, to try and reach a conclusion. You know, we've had two, two of the unions have settled already with Network Rail. I want to see, uh, hopefully, the RMT be able to do so uh, and to settle with the train operating companies. And there are also um, offers and, I hope, discussion going to be underway with that. So Aslef. the um, train operating companies do need your permission then to change... The, well, they've got, the they, they've got a revised mandate to, to make an offer to the, the trade unions to cover both pay but also, importantly, reform. And As I've said to you before, you've got to have pay and reform. And on reform. Um, and they'll be having those discussions um, this coming week. On reform. Is it true that you've scaled back <clears throat> the insistence on driver-only operated trains? 
No, we, we've been very clear. Reform's been on the table all the way through. The whole issue about driver-operated trains, I mean, they've been in existence, frankly, since I was a teenager, which I'm afraid is quite a long time ago, in the 1980s. 55% um, of passengers uh, travel on trains where driver-only operation is already in place. So this isn't a new thing. No, our, general, our general position... We're moving on, more towards it, right? Is, general, is that insistence been dropped? Our general position on reform is that reform is still incredibly important because it's, it's by having generational reform form on the railways, both Network Rail and the train operating companies, so we generate the savings to pay for the pay awards to staff and still have a financially sustainable railway. We, um, it's interesting, isn't it, because we, we spend an awful lot of time talking about trains, whether it's rail strikes, uh, HS2, but obviously the majority of journeys <coughs> are in the UK taken by bus and also by road. Yeah. Um, do you think that HS2 needs to be re-looked at? It takes an awful lot of money, right? Well, look, I think your general point is, is well made, and I've been very clear about that in the department. It's the Department for Transport, not the Department for Trains. And I'm very clear that most people, for most of their journeys, travel by road, as you said, either by car or by bus. Buses are actually incredibly for, uh, important form of public transport. But I think we, we should do all of the things. I think, actually, HS2 is an important investment. And sometimes people get, forget, partly because of the title of it, but actually the most important thing is about the capacity improvements that it puts so in no place. So no change, no change, um, HS2. So we, no, no, so we, the government's made it clear, the Chancellor made it clear in the, in the autumn statement that the government remains committed to delivering HS2. It's about improving the capacity of our rail network, um, which is important, because otherwise it's going to become congested uh, in the years to come. But that continues. But so does investment in our regular rail services and also, very importantly, in our bus and our road network. Um, now, just uh, to move on to one other uh, story <coughs> that's been uh, in the uh, co being covered a lot mm -hmm. uh, today, uh, Iran uh, has executed a British Iranian national after accusing him of spying for the UK. Now, you've announced some pretty limited sanctions. You've temporarily withdrawn Britain's ambassador to Iran for further consultations. Is that it? Well, look, the Foreign Secretary was very strong in the language that he used about the, language, the brutal yeah. killing of Mr Akbari. And obviously our thoughts are with his family. Um, we've recalled the ambassador for consultations and I think the Foreign Secretary is going to call in the Iranian charge d'affaires, their most senior diplomatic um, official in the UK, to make our views very clear to the Iranian government. And I know the Foreign Secretary is going to be thinking about what more we can do, uh, but we've made our position very clear in the strongest possible terms um, about this brutal act. And it just shows up, I think, the sort of regime um, uh, that, uh, that the Iranian government is. What, what kind of regime are they, then? Well, they're a regime that, that has treated one of their own citizens, a dual national, uh, in this incredibly brutal way. And that's not acceptable, which is why, as I said, the Foreign well, Secretary has made the him, British government's uh, views very, very clear indeed. Both the Foreign Secretary and the Prime Minister uh, made very clear that this was a brutal act um, and that we're going to take further steps. You are going to take further steps then? But we're going to think about what more we can do um, and using our diplomatic influence around the world to make it very clear to the Iranians that this sort of uh, terrible behaviour is unacceptable. We've, we're opposed to the death penalty in all circumstances and we condemn this brutal act. Um, now, Boris Johnson registered a donation of a million pounds this week. He's still considering a comeback, isn't he? Well, I don't know what uh, Boris Johnson's thinking about doing. You know, he's out uh, making money on the, the speaking circuit. Uh, I'm very clear the Prime Minister is focused on the priorities of the British people in terms of halving inflation, growing the economy, cutting NHS waiting lists uh, and stopping small boats. Those are the priorities of the people. That's what the Prime Minister and the government is focused on. Um, that's what we're spending our time thinking about, rather than thinking about what um, former Prime Ministers are doing. Come on, though. You know, people don't donate a million pounds to MPs who are just going to be sitting quietly on the back benches, do they? Well, well, look, the former Prime Minister is obviously out and about, you know, with speaking engagements, but the government and the Prime Minister are focused on those important priorities of but the British a, people. But this and is that's a donation. Not, not, doing. It's not outside anything, it's a, it's a donation from somebody. Well, look, people are free to donate money to whoever they like, and, and as long as those things are properly registered, that's absolutely fine. As I said, the Prime Minister and the government are focused on the public's priorities, which is what the public would expect us to be doing. Is he a distraction? No, not really. As I said, we're focused on our priorities, which is, say, halving inflation, growing the economy, uh, reducing NHS waiting lists 
and stopping small boats. That's what the government's focused on every day of the week. Uh, not everyone, of course, uh, thinks that Boris Johnson uh, is uh, an asset. I just want to look. This is one of the pictures of the week, I have to say, uh, from your predecessor as Transport Secretary, Grant Shapps. <laughs> There's Boris Johnson there in the middle of the photo. And as if by magic, <clears throat> hopefully, it is coming, I promise. Here we are. He disappears. Um, <laughs> what's going on there? Uh, well, I don't know. You'd, have to, you, you'd, you'd have to ask my, uh, you'd have to ask my predecessor what's happened with his with his social media. But look, I think that's one of those little funny things that happened during the week that I don't think we need to spend too much time on. But uh, very important point there is our very important focus on our space program and Britain's ambition to be a global leader in, in launching small satellites. I think that's what's important. Um, talking of Grant Shapp, some people say that Mick Lynch, for example, of the RMT, say that he's still pulling the strings to the government over the rail dispute, not you. No, well, that, that's not correct. I mean, you'll know since I became Transport Secretary, I met all the trade union leaders. Uh, I was very clear about making sure we had a, a new and improved, uh, fair, reasonable offer on the table. Uh, and both myself and the rail minister, Hugh Merriman, have been facilitating talks uh, with the rail unions, which is why I think we've made some progress and I'd hope we can make further progress. I want to stop these damaging disputes. They're bad for people who work on the railways and they're bad, most importantly, for passengers and the wider economy. So I think we've made a, a big change uh, since I became Transport Secretary and I hope to make continued progress. Are you optimistic then? Well, look, I, I very much hope we can get to a, s a solution to these rail disputes. Of course you They're hope. That's incredibly I mean, that's kind damaging. Of, meaningless. of course you well, hope that you're going to get a solution. I hope we can. I've made the changes that I think uh, are necessary to get us on a path to that. And okay. I said the trade unions and the employers are having detailed discussions, and I think it's important that we give them some space to hopefully hammer out an agreement uh, that can be put before union members and, it, and be accepted. OK, thank you very much.